Like The Wolf of Wall Street, American Maid is based on the real-life exploits of a lovable rogue, Barry Seal. Also, like The Wolf of Wall Street, it gets us rooting for our hero despite his engaging in morally questionable, not to mention illegal, activities like gun running and drug smuggling. To win us over, it uses many of the same techniques employed by The Wolf of Wall Street, having our dubious hero played by an extremely charismatic star, in this case, Tom Cruise, fully at home in the cockpit as another cocksure pilot, giving him a gorgeous blonde wife and adorable children for whom he's doing it all. And that standby of engaging villains from Richard III to House of Cards' Frank Underwood, breaking the fourth wall with confessions directly into the camera, thus making us co-conspirators. Recruitment In the movie, Seal is an ace pilot whose daredevil streak leads him from TWA to the CIA. He's bored of rigid flying commercial flights, so he takes to performing stunts that trigger the oxygen masks and terrify passengers. His aviation skills and reputation for sailing close to the wind lead to an approach from Schaefer, a CIA agent, or possibly a composite of several, played by Domhnall Gleeson, whose father, actor Brendan Gleeson, resembles the stocky real SEAL much more than sleek Tom Cruise does. Schaefer recruits SEAL to take reconnaissance photos of guerrillas operating in Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador, wooing him with the super-fast, super-nimble twin-engine plane. The real-life SEAL seems to have joined up with the CIA much earlier, the late investigative journalist Alexander Cockburn contended that SEAL first came into contact with the CIA in the 60s as a Special Forces helicopter pilot in Vietnam and maintained links with them throughout his TWA years. Other accounts suggest his links might have gone back as far as the Bay of Pigs. Moreover, although the film suggests SEAL was just an excitement-loving pilot who got swept up in espionage at the time, eight years earlier he had been attempting to fly 1,350 pounds of plastic explosives to some anti-Castro Cubans based in Mexico when he was arrested by the U.S. Customs Service. And far from resigning from TWA in 1978 to pursue this new, more exciting career in spying, he was fired in 1974 for falsely claiming medical leave when he actually was absent due to weapons trafficking. He escaped prosecution only because the CIA intervened, stating a trial would threaten national security. Enter the Medellin. In American Made, Seal is just minding his own business, refueling his plane in Colombia in 1980 when he is bundled into a car and taken to a hidden airstrip in the Colombian jungle. There he has made an offer he can't refuse by three businessmen in need of a pilot with the skills to navigate the dangerously short runway. One of these men happens to be Pablo Escobar. Already feeling undercompensated by the CIA for the loss of his TWA pension and healthcare, SEAL is swayed by the promise of $2,000 per kilo of cocaine brought to the US. In real life, according to statements in his Drug Enforcement Administration file, SEAL was smuggling marijuana as early as 1976 and began smuggling cocaine in 1978, well before any contact with the cartel. Arrested in Colombia the film has Seal becoming buddies with cartel kingpins Escobar and Ochoa. This comes after forming a lucrative partnership and parting with them at their penthouse in Cartagena, at least until the party is broken up by the Colombian army. The kingpins, plus Seal, are thrown in jail. But while the Colombians walk free the next day, Seal remains incarcerated until Schaefer gets him out. The agent later warns Seal that the smuggler has to get himself and his family out of Baton Rouge before sunrise in order to avoid a police raid and arranges for them to relocate to remote Mina, Arkansas, where the agency provides SEAL with not only a house, but also an airfield. In reality, SEAL was arrested with 40 kilograms of cocaine and spent nine months in a Honduran jail. There he met Ochoa's New Orleans business manager, who brought SEAL into the Medellin cartel's orbit in 1982. He became its chief link to cocaine markets in the southeastern US, with his 1981 bank record showing daily deposits of $50,000 into a Bahamian bank. Also, he moved to Mina of his own accord in 1982. In the movie, in return for his get out of jail free card, Schaefer wants Seal to fly AK-47s out of Mina to the Contras. The insurgent group tasked with overthrowing the Sandinistas, the left-wing movement that itself overthrew Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza de Bayo in 1979 and took his place. Then, Schaefer ups the ante by requiring Seal to return, bearing Contras who will be trained in Mina. Meanwhile, SEAL's old pals Ochoa and Escobar suggest he drop some of his guns off in Colombia and resume bringing in cocaine on the return trip. It is certainly true that SEAL's planes, by which now he had a fleet, flew from Mina to Colombia making refueling stops in Panama and Honduras, where the Contras were training. 
before returning laden with approximately $13 million worth of drugs. Cockburn, among several other journalists and historians, also alleged that a quid pro quo existed, with the CIA turning a blind eye to Seal's drug smuggling in return for his using it as a cover to get weapons to the Contras. Further, there are allegations that Seal brought several of his planes from CIA-owned companies such as Air America, which was itself the subject of Roger Spottiswood's 1990 movie of the same name, as well as Southern Air Transport. Busted. In the film's telling, the CIA abandoned SEAL, getting rid of any paper trail or hard evidence that could link them to the smuggler, right before the ATF, DEA, and FBI, as well as the state police, raid the MENA airport. SEAL is charged in Arkansas with weapons, drug, and money laundering offenses, but gets off with a community service order and is whisked off to the White House. In reality, the DEA busted SEAL for smuggling 200,000 quaaludes into Florida in 1983. Facing a 10-year stretch, he was desperate to make a deal, but the DEA wasn't interested. Going over their heads, he met two members of then Vice President George H.W. Bush's Task Force on Drugs, offering his services as an undercover informant. Lured by the promise of getting inside information on the Medellin cartel, in March 1984, the DEA listed SEAL as an official informant and got his sentence reduced. What happened next is murky. According to Robert Jora, the DEA agent working with SEAL, on the next pick of either Escobar or Ochoa, told SEAL the cartel was moving its base from Colombia to Nicaragua and giving a cut of its profits to the Sandinistas in exchange for use of an airfield in Managua. But given that the cartel was operating more or less with impunity everywhere else in Central America, and this would only further antagonize the US, another theory suggests this was a scheme cooked up by SEAL and Ochoa to keep SEAL on the good side of the intelligence community. At any rate, Seal went to Florida to face long-delayed sentencing on his Quailu bust, receiving 10 years reduced to six months probation thanks to letters of support from the CIA and DEA. At this point, American Made introduces the controversial figure of Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, Reagan's point man on anti-Sandinistas activities, who is keen to give Seal one more mission, to obtain proof the Nicaraguan government is in bed with the cartel. To this end, they modify his new, former Army C-123 transport plane so that it can take photographs unobtrusively. SEAL flies to Managua and duly obtains pictures of Escobar and Sandinista soldiers taking delivery of kilos of cocaine. But in his haste to nail the commies so that Congress will fund arms shipments, North releases the pictures before the Colombians are in custody. His cover blown, SEAL is of no further use to the DEA, who promptly sees his assets. Worse, he must spend the rest of his life looking over his shoulder for a vengeful cartel. In real life, SEAL's cover was blown even before the photographs appeared, when, thanks to NSC and CIA leaks, the Washington Times ran a front page story on the Sandinistas' drug trafficking on July 17, 1984. But Congress was not persuaded and passed the Bulland Amendment prohibiting direct military aid to the Contras. Aftermath and Death as in the movie, three men shot Seal to death as he sat outside a Salvation Army in Baton Rouge in his white Cadillac. He died on February 19, 1986, and three Colombian men were convicted of his murder. Even if some of the specifics vary, the film is true to two essential elements of Seal's story. One, he made a hell of a lot of money. Estimates range from $50 million to $5 billion. In any case, it all seems to have disappeared. Secondly, Seal was a man caught between a rock and a hard place. As his brother Wendell said, he had become entangled in so many relationships, it was hard to tell who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. Thank you guys so much for watching our first video. If you made it through here, that means you like our content. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe as this will help our channel grow. Which movie based on a true story would you like to see next? Let us know in the comments and until next time.